Implementing an encoder and a decoder for Base64 might be easier than you think. So let's look at how this encoding works and how to implement a simple encoder slash decoder tool with Python. Since forever, humanity has relied on encodings, like for example reading a sun clock or understanding what different sequences from a bell in a church mean, smoke signals and writing. Although depending on who does it, this last one might be considered encryption as well. And the need for encodings has only increased when computers became a thing. We have, for example, different encodings for characters like Latin 1, ASCII or Unicode, compression encodings like gzip or encodings which help us store or move arbitrary data like for example JSON. You're most likely familiar with JSON. It's used pretty much everywhere on the internet but it has one slight limitation and that is that the data encoded in it must follow certain structure. Now this becomes a problem when the data we want to handle can just be transformed into this structure, like for example images. And that's where Base64 comes into play. Its purpose is to represent any type of data, or shall I say sequence of bytes, as a string combination made from 64 unique characters. An example encoded string might look like this. Now let's look at a simple implementation of a Base64 encoder and decoder with Python. The basis for our example comes from this project on GitHub, but I pretty much changed everything. I'll put a link to both this project and to my code in the description. Before we begin though, we quickly need to look at some theory. To understand how the encoding works, let's first look at the input bytes, which are 8 digit binary numbers. The first thing we'll do is we'll mash all these bytes together to form one long stream of 1s and zeros. Then we'll split this stream at every 6 places instead of the original 8. Why we do that? Well, what is the highest number you can represent with a 6 digit binary number? You guessed it, it's 64. And that's exactly how many characters we have available for encoding. Next we take these chunks of bytes and we treat them as an index into our lookup. Then to decode this back into its original form, we just reverse the order of these operations. And in essence, this is how base64 works. The only thing left for us to handle is the case where the last 6 digit chunk isn't complete. In this case, we either add 1 or 2 null bytes to the end of the stream, so that the length of this stream of 1s and zeros is divisible by both 6 and 8. And these trailing null 6 digit chunks are represented by a special symbol equal sign. This part is referred to as padding. Finally, let's look at some code. As usual, let me scroll through the file before doing anything else. The code consists of the encoding function, decoding function, and some glue code. You can see that the example is pretty short, but there's a lot going on nonetheless. But don't worry, all of these scary operations on 8s and 6s will start to make sense in a bit. Let me just make it clear that there is a lot of room for performance improvements here, but I prioritize that you understand what's going on above that. So at the top of the file, we have the lookup of characters, which is needed by both encoding and decoding functions. First, let's start with the encoding part. The function signature shows us that the input is an array of bytes and returns a string. We begin by looping over the input bytes and we assemble one giant string of ones and zeros called bits. Now, this here doesn't do anything crazy. It just prints the byte with leading zeros so that all bytes are eight places long. Then we calculate how many padding characters we need at the end. The value of this variable here can be either 0, 1 or 2. After these preparations, we loop over the bits string, which is the concatenation of all bytes we assembled earlier, and we loop over it with 6 bit chunks, and that's what this range function is doing. So with this index, we first retrieve the chunk, and by treating it as a binary integer, we get a symbol from the lookup list with it. We also need to handle the case where the last chunk isn't 6 places long. So in this case, we just add a few zeros to its end. So inside this for loop, we basically assembled the encoded string by translating the 6 digit chunks with a lookup. And the last thing we need to do before returning the result is to append the equal signs as padding. And with that, the encoding part is done. Now for the decoding. The first thing we notice is that the signature of the function is reversed. So we receive the encoded string and we return the bytes. 
At the start, we do the same thing as with encoding, but the other way around. We loop over the input, but instead of getting a character from the lookup with an index, we get the index by using the character. And as before, we add leading zeros so that all chunks are six digit. Also, as we're looping, we ignore the padding characters and all white space. Now, after we have the stream of bits, we loop over it by using eight bit chunks. And basically the only thing we need to do is we need to convert this string of eight ones and zeros into an 8-bit integer and append it to the output array. This check here just makes sure that if a chunk contains less than 8 places, it's considered as leftover from padding characters. After we process all bytes, we just return the produced byte array from the function and we're done. And I'm glad to tell you that we're basically done. We just need a way to test drive this thing. If we scroll down a bit, I prepared a little something just for demonstration purposes. So now if we run this file as a script, we can use it the same way as the base64 CLI tool. You can see that if the minus D argument is provided, we decode the input from standard in and print it to standard out. And if the argument is not provided, we encode everything that comes in through the standard in and also print the result to the standard out. The important thing to note here is that we treat data as bytes. We don't need to know if it's UTF-8 encoded or whatever. And that's why when encoding we use buffer.read lines and when decoding we use buffer.write. You might notice the text wrap package I used when printing the encoded string. That's just because I thought it would be cool to wrap output lines at 76 places so that it matches the way that the CLI tool does it. Now let's test drive this thing real quick. First, I'll just encode a simple string. And to verify that the output is correct, let's decode it using the CLI tool. And now to verify that the decoding works, let's do it the other way around. So let's use the CLI tool to encode the same input. And let's decode it using our tool. And it works! Now we know that our script can handle strings, but can it run on any type of data? Well, to test this, I have a JPEG in this directory. Let's see if our script can handle this. Now this command will first encode the image and then decode it using our script. And then I'll just reroute the output to a file with a different name. And now let's see if the two images are the same. As you can see, there is no difference, which means that our script works correctly. And that concludes our video. I hope you learned something. If you liked the video, please consider subscribing. And as always, thank you for watching, and I hope to see you again. Bye!